Good evening, Endo Summit Live, and welcome to our third edition in this season. We have a very exciting evening for you because we are talking all about adhesions and endometriosis. For those of you joining us on Instagram Live for the first time, we are happy to have you. Facebook, YouTube, and LinkedIn, we are thrilled to have you as well. Please welcome our season's co-host, Dr. John DeLumba. Dr. DeLumba, can you introduce yourself? Sure. <clears throat> Excuse me. I'm John DeLemba from Texas, down in Denton, Texas, a little bit north of Dallas. And, and um, on December 31st, I'm going to stop doing surgery because <clears throat> I'm getting old, but I'm going to still be doing some other things. Um, <clears throat> some people in, uh, invited me and it, um, I'm not going to be doing surgery, but I'm going to still be seeing some patients as consultant and and things like that. So um, I've been doing this for a long time. I do have a huge focus on adhesions. Um, because in my opinion, endometriosis is horrible, but it's a disease. And to me, adhesions, sadly, are normal because it's the normal healing process of our body. And I don't know if we have time because I will probably have to leave about 740, uh, you know, about 45 minutes. Um, but I'd like to share with people on one of my classmates discovery that he won the Nobel Prize for in medicine in 2019 that will have a huge impact on the healing process. It's actually not healing, it's regeneration. So. Very cool. Also joining us this evening are the California crew and they are significantly earlier than we are. So we are very grateful to have them. Dr. Fat Hatcher, can you introduce yourself? You are a first time Endo Summit Live participant. You're muted. Uh, thank you very much for inviting me. Uh, I'm Serena Fadacher. Um, I've been trained for endometriosis and minimal invasive surgery at Center of Endometriosis Care. And then also I've done Eurogyne Fellowship. So I've been doing endometriosis uh, pretty hardcore for the past couple of, couple of years in Long Beach, California. And thank you very much for inviting me to participate. We are excited to have you. And now our other Northern Californian, Dr. Mona Oradi, who is coming to us from her brand new practice. Can you introduce yourself? Yeah. So my name is Dr. Mona Oradi. I'm a minimally invasive GYN surgeon. Um, <clears throat> I've been practicing for over 20 years um, doing minimally invasive surgery. And probably the last 10 years, I've been exclusively focused on endometriosis and fibroids, or actually more than that, probably. Um, and we did just open the Orati Women's Clinic um, here in San Francisco, which is meant to be a center for holistic care for women with menstrual disorders, fibroids, endometriosis, and obviously excellent surgical care as well in order to help women get out of pain, get pregnant, have a happy sex life, and all the things that we need to help our endometriosis uh, patients and women in general to achieve. Yes, uh, there is one Endo Summit Live, which I'll broadcast um, actually from San Francisco because I'm going out to do something with Dr. Wasson and I thought I should stop by. If the oh, time then you works, should, I'm going to come visit. Yeah, yeah, I, mean, I think that'll visit. be cool. And yeah. I'll get to see the kids. So let's get right to it. Let's talk about adhesions. What is... And adhesion, and what kind of symptoms might they cause, Dr. Arati? So adhesions is basically abnormal tissue or inflammatory tissue that develops, that adheres or sticks one some, some structure to another structure. So basically, anytime two organs or two different structures stick together, that, those are called adhesions. And they can be filmy or thin, they can be thick, they can be dense. Um, they can be solid, they can have blood vessels, they can have nerves, they can be innervated, it depends on what causes adhesions and how it developed and how long it's been there. Um, things that adhesions can cause is a lot of things. So in, in women specifically, adhesions around the fallopian tubes can cause fallopian tube dysfunction, can cause swelling of the fallopian tube and therefore cause infertility because of the inability 
of the fallopian tube to transfer the egg to the uterus. Adhesions around the uterus or around the rectum or around the bladder can shift organs. So the ovaries can shift, things can get stuck together, the ovaries can get stuck, the uterus can be stuck to the sidewall, the bladder can get stuck to the uterus, the rectum can get stuck to the uterus. So things can kind of adhere together. And very classically in what we call, you know, stage four endometriosis or the frozen pelvis, it's kind of where everything is stuck together from that severe inflammation caused by the endometriosis, that just everything is kind of brought to the midline and everything's stuck together. The ureters are displaced, the bladder's displaced, the rectum's displaced, the, the, the bowel is displaced, and everything is adherent together. And that causes a lot of pain. It can obviously infertility, it can cause bowel symptoms, bloating, you know, partial bowel obstructions, indigestion painful bowel movements, severe constipation. It can cause bladder symptoms, feeling like you have to pee all the time, urgency, frequency. And then it can just cause pain, pain on the right side, pain on the left side, pulling pain, sharp pain, all sorts of different kinds of pain. So adhesions is a component of endometriosis. Now, not everyone with endometriosis has adhesions, but everyone who has, uh, but everyone with severe endometriosis where there is a severe inflammatory component adhesions can develop and distort and displace organs. And a lot of times that's why things are shifted around. And a lot of times it does contribute to pain and infertility. And as an endometriosis surgeon who goes in to remove endometriosis, especially in younger, in younger women or women who haven't had kids yet, it's very important for us to focus on preventing those adhesions from reforming or preventing the trauma of doing surgery itself from causing adhesions that can cause problems in the future. Very interesting. I wonder, you said a, a sentence I think we could have a little discussion about. I mean, millions of sentences. Millions, yeah, right. <laughs> this, this is one sentence. So um, Dr. Jalamba, Dr. Um, Fat Thatcher, uh, Dr. Arati said adhesions are an abnormal tissue. Do you guys have a theory or a comment on that? Go ahead, Dr. D. Well, I don't, I actually, I don't think it's abnormal. Um, it's actually normal. When our genetics are such that when we are injured in any way that we have to heal. And <clears throat> one of the things that, that Dr. Jung presented in, uh, we discussed it at their last Endo Summit meeting in Florida last year, was that um, if you operate on a fetus before 24 weeks, they are born without a scar. Mm -hmm. But if you operate on a fetus after 24 weeks, they're born with a scar. And nobody's figured it out until my classmate's discovery, and he didn't even think about it. I sent him an email. He goes, oh, my gosh, we never thought of that. But they did some studies. So why would somebody at 24 weeks or before not scar? Because that tissue is hypoxic, and our our gene, our HIF one, hypoxia inducing factor one, is turned on when it's hypoxic. Once we become oxygenated, when that skin is now thicker, and it can get blood flow, it turns off. Think of a salamander when we pull the tail off; it doesn't scar. It comes back as a normal tail because many amphibians have HIF one on. And that's what I was talking about earlier. So. For humans, when we are injured, I, I just fell last week when I was taking my grandson. We were doing paintball. And I was thinking I was a lot younger and faster. And I fell and cut my knee. It's almost healed from Sunday to Monday. Eight days. It's basically healed. And But there's going to be a tiny scar there. It doesn't come back as normal skin. So there's normal as abnormal aspects, as Dr. already mentioned. But you can have fibrosis. You can have... Uh, scarring. I mean, think of a burn victim. They'd love to have normal, normal skin growing back, but they don't because it's been damaged so severely. So uh, it, it's it's a normal process causing abnormal things, in my opinion. And it, it starts from red blood cells, platelets, blood clots, fibrin, fibrinogen, inflammation, a whole cascade of events. And and one thing I did want to mention because Doctor already went through a, a, a whole litany of of what can cause it. But sometimes we forget even ovulation has the potential to cause adhesion. Because when an egg pops out, what can come with it? Blood. Now mm. we've got a raw surface and you have blood and organs can start to stick to each other. 
So it, it, it's just so fascinating. They don't teach <clears> us a lot of this in, in medical school and residency. Uh, you know, I, general surgeons are taught adhesions don't cause pain and there's, unless there's complete or partial bowel obstruction. It's crazy. I agree with John. I think actually I have done a study for three years for uh, when I was a Eurogyne fellow in University of Oklahoma regarding a prolapse is actually uh, the chronic inflammation of the muscle injury that it doesn't regenerate and complete, it does not complete the cycle. So what happened is the fibrotic tissue is actually causing prolapse for women in pelvic. And basically the birth injury that the pelvic floor gets and then end up resulting having advanced prolapse in the future on the genetically predisposed people and patient. So I do think I agree with John. I think that what happened here is I think the process doesn't get completed and the adhesion happened. Adhesion is actually can be kind of like a, a defense mechanism of the body. Basically, when you cannot complete the, pro complete the process of the healing and then you create the surface of a uh, tissue in between the another tissue is just basically providing some sort of a barrier to get more damage because the fibrotic tissue protecting another tissue. However, that I agree with John. I think the adhesion can cause many things. Can cause the, the can cause the effective of motility of the bowel. So it basically can affect the bowel angle and then can cause causing uh, the GI uh, symptoms for the patient, obviously, and can cause pain by pulling on the muscles and, and the nerves. So I agree. I think that the whole thing is, is just not completing the injury process in the proper way, ending up with, with more adhesive. And as we've seen, we have seen stage four endometriosis in very young patients. When I think I've seen a stage four endometriosis in 24 year olds up to 22 years old, John is more experienced, probably seeing more, but or all the way, if somebody is low stage of endometriosis being delayed diagnosis and had multiple other surgeries with other surgeons, and then all of a sudden showing up at the age of 37 with a stage four endometriosis, because the whole damage, the whole injury, the repetitive, repetitive injury that does not complete the cycle, causing this kind of fibrotic tissue and then causing a damage to the tissue, causing the dense adhesions. Yes, one thing I always think about with adhesions, like when you, I started in orthopedics. So when you have an ankle sprain, that's ligament, right? You're never going to regrow ligament. When you are rehabbing an ankle, you're regrowing basically um, scar tissue, right? And the goal is to have the scar tissue instead of organizing like this to do in an orthopedic sense, the physical therapy or the bracing or whatever you're going to do to have it laid down in an organized um, pattern. So I think adhesions happen as a response to insult to the body. It's just on a whole other level when it's surgery versus like an ankle sprain. Now, one thing that's unique with um, endometriosis is the disease itself creates adhesions. Does anyone want to comment on sort of the difference between adhesions created by the disease and adhesions created by treating the disease? Yeah, I mean, there's that's that's what I was talking about. So part, partly what I was mentioning. So adhesions created by the disease is because endometriosis is endometrium by definition that's growing outside of the uterus in areas where there's no normal. We have the shirts. We have the shirts even that endometriosis is not endometrium. Endometrial tissue. It's not endometrial. All right, we can't have that debate here. We can have that at the summit, but so endometriosis. Logically, it's not endometrium. Okay, it's... I miss the big guy though. Okay, fine. Endometrial like tissue, but um. Uh, sorry to to bother. Sorry, sorry to interrupt. That's actually my argument with pathologists. You know, because I go to excise all this endometriosis, and they don't read it endometriosis sometimes because they don't know. But thank you. Go Thank you. So the inflammation caused by that abnormal tissue that's growing on the other surfaces of the pelvis causes an inflammatory reaction, cytokines and all sorts of inflammation. And that inflammation is what causes the formation of the adhesions and things to shift and things to stick together. So that is, that's a different type of inflammation than the adhesions that form from surgery. Adhesions form during treating the disease or cutting out the tissue is 
that if we can minimize the trauma, we'll minimize the adhesions. But every time you touch something or you traumatize something, an inflammatory reaction then happens because of the healing and that inflammation, again, those cytokines, collagen, things lay down and that causes the adhesions to form as the healing process develops. So it, adhesions form because of inflammation, because of trauma. It's the healing. That's how the body heals is to form those adhesions. So it just in endometriosis, if we can minimize the amount of inflammation with endometri in endometriosis patients, it's possible we could minimize the adhesions that form over time. And similarly in surgery, if we can minimize the trauma that we are causing tissue while we're doing surgery and help the healing process to happen with, with less inflammation, less cytokines, less macrophages, less inflammatory reaction, we can minimize the adhesions that form after surgery as well. I'm going to make it very simple. So I think it's uh, if somebody is not in medicine, understand it in a better way. When we have inflammation, what's happening to the organ? When there's inflammation means there's edema and there is heat. Mm -hmm. And what is heat does to the to the body cause and the proteins get denuded and then causing basically when you have a beef, you're, you're grilling a, a meat on a, on, a, on in an oven or something like that. You will see the protein get charcoal, right? But not to that level. When they get the, their two organs in the body, they have inflammation and they have higher level of a temperature from the normal body. They can adhere together to the surface, and that the higher of the temperature, the more dense adhesions. That that is. Uh, that can happen to the organs, including like your liver to the diaphragm. It can happen to the bowel um, and, and et cetera. Or maybe you've got to have endometriosis somewhere else. That's, that, I think that's an easy way to explain it. However, the difference between that adhesion versus the uh, uh, iatrogenic adhesion, which means it's been produced by surgeons um, or, or uh, previous surgery, I think after surgery, bleeding as causing adhesions. So if you use uh, uh, you, you, the, the more delicate di dissection you have, the less bleeding you have, and the more that you actually using uh, uh, like a new product like uh, PRP and et cetera to prevent, to, to actually help him with the coagulation factor and casket, then you're gonna have less adhesion in the future. So I think those are the two different things. That's why I think as an endometriosis surgeon, I would like to have a patient that nobody, that basically a virgin abdomen or virgin pelvis. I think that's we'd the all, best. We'd part. all love to have virgin pelvis. We huh? all love that. <laughs> and, and, exactly. But here's the key though, when you go back in on your patients, you will still want to have like a virgin pelvis. Like that's my goal that when I go back in on a patient that I operated on before that there's no adhesions, that it looks just like they did the first time. Well, so, I'm a big fan of eighties. So I always play eighties in my operating room. So yes, like a virgin is a good one. Like a virgin, right? but, Yeah. Yeah. But I do think, I do think these are the two difference between we surgeons creating adhesions versus the natural adhesions. That natural inflammation versus I mean, I think we have uh, to bleeding try to, We have to try to minimize both, right? And Correct. I'm sure yes. there's going to be more studies because, I mean, patients with endometriosis, it's it's progressive. Even you know they can they can, it can it, sometimes it comes back. Sometimes adhesions form even after you've removed it. Or you know you have endometriosis and you don't want to have surgery now. You're a teenager and you know you're you're treating it. Is there a way that we can prevent them from then becoming that frozen pelvis later on? Is there some some way we can prevent the things from sticking together and the severe inflammation that has is, that happens with endometriosis, so that when we when that it doesn't progress as fast and cause as much adhesions? I mean, there's really two components. We want to prevent adhesions before, and we want to prevent adhesions afterwards. So, although you know, although also beside that, I think the genetic factor. Uh, also, some some has you know some sort of a role here. If if and then also high risk behavior. If you if you for example if you have endometriosis and then you had you know PID means STD that can cause problems on top of another problem oh, yeah. for for the surgery. So I think those are the two things that can you have to think about 
which one is endometriosis, which caused by endometriosis, and which one caused by other things? Well, I mean, not just not just PID, which is an infection in the pelvis, but have you ever thought of those patients that go to the ER and they're told, oh, you have a ruptured cyst and there's there's blood in their abdomen all over, like you can literally yeah. see the blood and they tell them, oh yeah, just go home. It'll yeah. go away. I'm like, I want to laparoscope those people and clean out all that blood. Like all that blood that's coming out of that ruptured cyst or endometriosis tissue or whatever it is that just ruptured and spread all over the place. That's going to cause adhesions. Like, it, especially these younger women, why can't we stick it? For me, a mini, I'm a mini person. I would stick a mini laparoscope in them and just wash it out and just like help them First of all, that blood is what's hurting them, right? It's causing inflammation in the peritoneum. Why can't we clean out that blood and, and stop sending home all these people that go to the hospital with ruptured cysts? Because I think we're, we're just buying them adhesions. I don't think any of them really have rupture. I don't think that many have rupture cysts as the ER tells them to have that. But that's a whole other lie. Some, some do though. I've I've seen Definitely. patients where, where I see them post, you know, post their ER visit and they still have blood in their pelvis, you know? Yeah. Let Dr. Jalumba, you want to comment. And then we happen to have a webinar crasher that was watching. Okay. Dr. Well, Jalumba, you first. Okay. Do Dr. Hardy, you're absolutely correct. And this actually was looked at back when laparoscopy was still in its infancy uh, with infection, with bleeding, anything, that instead of just watching them and put them on antibiotics, which you still can do, uh, you go in and you clean it out and they're going to see significantly less pain and, and, and mm -hmm. issues in the future. And Dr. Fadiger, you're, you're, you're absolutely correct in, in that you have to find ways to, to decrease these adhesions. And so when I talk to my patients, I talk to them about one, the, the, exactly what you mentioned, accuracy and precision. And that's why as a robotic surgeon, um, having been a laparoscopic surgeon, the, I think the accuracy and precision, getting rid of more endometriosis and accuracy and precision in those tissue planes is key right. um, for any surgeon um, to decrease adhesion formation. The second is many of us are using heated and humidified carbon dioxide, not for where we operate, it's for the non-surgical areas that can dry out on a long surgery. So it's like mm -hmm. holding your eye down and doing this. And then at some point, I think we can talk about barriers. But the last one, and I want to get this in here. So, uh, you know, it's called a second look surgery. There's only two people that I'm aware of, other than maybe some infertility docs, that do second looks as gynecologists. They're used in every, every other specialty, like general surgeons for bowel stuff. Well, a lot of the data out there has not been supportive of this. I've been doing them for about 20 years because a doctor in Germany, Dr. Krasinski, convinced me. So what you do is you do your surgery. You do everything you're supposed to do. Cut out the endometriosis, cut adhesions, do everything you're supposed to do. And then you go back in within three to seven days after surgery. Why? Well, because that's the healing cascade of events. And when we were at the end of the summit, I put up a slide that showed um, from October 2009, an, art, uh, an article that talked about this. And it says, by day three, you've already formed the adhesion. By day five, it's starting to get blood vessels. There are no new adhesions from that injury, say surgery, mm -hmm. after day seven. So the theory is by interrupting this cascade of events, which isn't smart, that you may see less adhesions. So I know what works as barriers, what doesn't work as barriers, how many patients get adhesions, about 80% of patients get adhesions. 20 don't, but I can never tell who. I've been, I thought, oh, this lady's going to have tons. None. Oh, she shouldn't have any. I already did any adhesions. So you don't even know, but 20% don't. But by interrupting that cycle, and I don't do it, but it was done in some of the Scandinavian countries, Dr. Jansen did them. They did a third look to see how effective it was when you interrupted in that cycle, in that cascade. 70% of those adhesions that were there on the second look did not form a reform, but 30% did. So it's not perfect, but it, it is really beneficial in patients, especially when when you see adhesion, when you see pain about three to six months after surgery from an endometriosis uh, focused doctor that's got good skills, three to six months, and all of a sudden they're hurting again. And they go, My endo's back. I'm like, Am I that bad that in three to six months your endo's back? No, it's almost always adhesions. And when we get that all the time pain, that's from adhesion, scarring, and fibrosis.
I had to throw that in. Sorry. We have Dr. Chung joining us who was watching and decided he needed to jump out of his seat. Dr. Chung, you have a comment? Did you hear me? No. Yes. Yeah, I can hear you now. Okay. Yeah, I support what John was saying. All these adhesion form within the first week. Mm -hmm. But I think there's a lot to do with genetics because adhesion form and then the fibrinolysis is supposed to help out with clear the adhesions. So that's a genetic. When it fail, adhesion form. So um, does adhesion cause pain? Not necessarily. And we have all these, uh, you know, John, you are as old as I am. Well, you're a little bit more senior. Okay, but I'm just saying I do have to say one thing. All you have to do is look at a burn victim. The, yep. Look up New York City fireman face transplant. And he was going blind, not because his eye was injured, because they would cut the cut the scarring and the fibrosis that was squeezing. And they had to give him a new face because you can cut the adhesions all you want. Now you've got two raw surfaces like spaghetti and meatballs in there. Your body doesn't know good from bad healing. It has to fix itself. That's right, exactly. Adhesion form from whatever inflammatory changes infection, trauma, it's going to form adhesions. And then when adhesion form, when the body doesn't know how to take it down, that's going to form the permanent adhesions. But, so, but our, our, our role as surgeons is to, to minimize the trauma so that we can minimize the adhesion form. Well, yes. And to exactly. try to help that healing process in order to, to, to try to, again, minimize the adhesions. My, yeah, my point I, is, as surgeons... I don't think we can blame genetics or surgery or endo or, or, uh, for all the adhesions. I think we have to kind of, you know, take some responsibility uh, and say that there's we have to do everything we can do as a surgeon in order to protect. Well, I think so, Doctor Chang, Mona, Mona, Mona is I right. We're not, you, we're, we're, we're not, we're not arguing about about what, about the the root of adhesion. We say, well, this has happened, right? There's two different adhesions. One is patiently, basically endometriosis caused adhesion. The other one is a surgeon causing adhesions. But then we're going to come to see how we're going to approach this adhesions in, in surgery, right? Because you're about to operate on the patient and you have a frozen pelvis. How do you, what are you going to, how are you going to approach that? So you should be able to, <clears throat> I think everyone, uh, every one of us should be able to process that okay, I'm about to operate on a stage four endometriosis. Okay, so be ready for it. What am I going to do about that? So think about that. I think that's the main, that, that's yeah. just going to be more productive conversation, I think. So. Exactly, yeah. I, I agree with you, though. So when there's a frozen pelvis, that's already adhesions. So are you going to not take it down because of adhesions? But when it's yeah. endometriosis... No, it it, no, we are. We are taking it down. You, how are you going to take it down, and what are you going to do to prevent it from reforming and sticking? Well, back? that's the next. That's, that's the next the part yeah. of the discussion. Well, yeah, that's so, my. That's what I was trying to say, adhesion form because of inflammatory changes. When you remove adhesion, eighty percent of them is going to reform. That's a given. There's no doubt about it from the same site. Okay, that's studies and study overprove that it's. Adhesion reform is 80% on the same site. But again, though, if it's adhesion caused by endometriosis, you remove the adhesions. They're very good. But I think the technical skill of minimizing the trauma, removing the blood, less chalk, not charring, and that's the bottom line of adhesion preventions. So no matter what we do to prevent adhesions, it's a genetic that's going to take over. That's well, how I feel. Awesome. I, I, would, I would like to say one thing, though, because don't yeah. believe what I said or what a study says. Maybe get a, an IRB, maybe get, you know, a, just do a small case series that you're going to publish on just 10 cases. Just 10 cases. Go in and do a second look in five days. Don't do seven, because I used to do seven. Do it. Tell your patient that you're looking at this and, and insurance companies pay for it too, by the way, or I wouldn't be doing it. So it's not an issue like, oh, well, I'm not going to get paid for this. And you say second look surgery. And and Lots you of will be shocked at what you find. That's all I have to say is you will be shocked. I, I've been done it five, five, ten cases. I've seen it. 
they always going to be just like exactly what you said. Adhesion was there. And within the three weeks, it's always there. You can break them down. So within the first week, as you say, that we're going to go in, you can actually free all this film adhesion from the surgery. I, I mean, I don't necessarily agree with that everyone's going to get adhesions or even 80%. I mean, I maybe I haven't done second look, but I've re-operated on patients that I've operated on and the majority of them have very little to no adhesions. So, well, I, I want to, I want to move forward into a different section. So well, let's talk about adhesion prevention. Yeah. We're going to do it, it, it. So we'll start with you, Dr. Orati. You're working with different techniques in terms of yeah. adhesion prevention. And then we'll um, send it to Saruna and talk about what he is doing for adhesion prevention. Dr. Orati. Yeah. So there's many different things you can do for adhesion prevention. And as we know, and what we've been talking about, adhesions is caused by trauma, right? The tissue healing process is what causes adhesions. So in order to prevent adhesions, you have to think about every aspect of the surgery you're doing and absolutely minimize any kind of trauma in any way. And that means trauma touching injury, trauma dehydrating in uh, the tissue, trauma causing bleeding, trauma with the energy that you use to causing burning with the energy trauma with how much you're removing what you're doing and then obviously in in doing things that prevent adhesions or help with the healing process so it's just some of the things that we can address with adhesion prevention now, first of all you have to minimize the amount of the, the, the invasiveness of the surgery you're doing. So using, as uh, Dr. DeLumba said, using a robot, very, using uh, the robotic uh, instruments, you're, you're causing less trauma because you have much more precision and you only have to touch and pick up what you have to touch and pick up. You don't have to, you have the risk to be able to work around things rather than having to move things out of your way in order to work that way. Um, using mini microlaparoscopy, smaller incisions when you're doing uh, less less uh, less stage disease and you're not doing as much dissection, minimizing the dissection as as I will going going into correct planes, not causing bleeding while you're dissecting, minimizing the energy that touches the tissue. So I use a laser, for example, the CO two laser because that minimizes the amount of thermal damage that you can cause to nearby structures. And it gives you the most precise cut without any kind of tissue trauma. And you're you're literally not even touching the tissue. You're just using the laser to li literally circumscribe and cut out the endometriosis without really damaging anything underneath or around that tissue. You're using it with very point precision so that when at the end of your surgery, you've really minimized any tissue that's been touched, any tissue that's been squeezed, any tissue that has that had caused bleeding, any tissue that you've applied um, thermal energy to, and then being very precise and specific about what you're going to cut out, what you're not going to cut out, re removing just the endometriosis, not like going into out into normal tissue. You don't want to go so deep that you're in normal tissue. You want to just go around the endometriosis, remove the endometriosis, shave it off, and then over sew up and repair anything that you do. If you're going to remove an endometrioma off of the ovary, being very precise with the robot to remove the endometrioma and then repair that ovary exactly edge to edge so that the two edges heal together properly. And then other techniques that I use is I use adhesion prevention barrier uh, which is 4% iso isodextrin, which is called ADAPT, which is a liquid adhesion barrier that we put inside the abdomen at the end of the case. And it basically coats everything with this icodextrin matrix. And it hangs around that fluid kind of sloshes around for three to four days. And that's during that three to four day process, having that solution there prevents those adhesions that Dr. DeLumba was again talking about. Most adhesions are going to form in those first three to four days after surgery. So putting this barrier in there prevents those adhesions from forming. And then the last method that I prevent adhesions is by suspending the ovaries away from the area of dissection, prevents that ovary from laying on the area that's been denuded or where you've removed endometriosis so that it doesn't stick to that area. And we've all seen ovaries kind of stuck to the sidewall, stuck on the ureter, stuck in the cul-de-sac, stuck in the ovarian fossas. And by just elevating those ovaries away for again, those three to four days where everything is gonna reperitonealize and heal and then releasing those ovaries that prevents the adhesions that can form around the ovaries and fallopian tubes. So those are just a few things. And 
my experience has been that when I have had to go back in for any reason to go remove an appendix or whatever, the adhesions that I've seen in my patients have been very minimal. And I think it's a combination. I have a whole lecture we're going to talk about an endometriosis summit about this, but I think being very, very cognizant of adhesion prevention is going to minimize adhesions. Now, have I prevented 100% of adhesions? No, of course not. There are still some, but if you minimize them, we can minimize the damage and the, and the trauma that can happen from the adhesions. Saruna, I have a question. Are you straight sure. stick or are you robotics? I'm both. But uh, if okay. I, I, dip, I, I kind of like, so I'm, I'm going to go through this. Uh, for, for I, I kind of uh, opened adhesions, a lot of them with, with laparoscope. And then, um, and then I do CO2 laser with the robot because I can see better if there's anything left, uh, left behind. I, I, the reason I like to go open a lot of adhesions with, uh, with the laparoscope because I like the haptal feedback. I like to feel things. I like to feel the tissue before I I, I go excise it, <clears throat> and um, and I also sometimes using a laparoscope uh, CO two laser with a laparoscope. I, I I learned to do a CO two laser with Chenis and Ervo, and I, you know I I love it. I mean I've been using it since then. We don't and... love the laser anymore since they're no longer sponsoring the summit. Enough with the laser. Oh okay. We need to get them to sponsor. Enough, we're done with the laser. <laughs> Don't but, Boston scientific. But, no, we but, need to get I them have. to sponsor it. We need to get it, them to sponsor it. It is an amazing but, tool. Yeah. Um, it 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 has a precision nothing else has. It'll be right. interesting at the summit because Patrick and Mona are gonna do a dueling podium on adhesions, and he is straight stick only. So it'll be interesting to hear you guys discuss this. What yeah. what else is your approach, Sir? <clears throat> um, so I okay, I kind of like have an outline about adhesions. I have a pre the preoperatively I screen my patients by doing a history. I know if I'm dealing with a stage four endometriosis, if I'm uh, dealing with the obliterative cul de sac in my examination, <clears throat> and then during the surgery, I most most of my patient most of, actually I decided to do majority of my endometriosis patient. I'll put the, I'll put the stent for the both ureters because I know I'm going to deal with adhesions. So I either use the iris that I can see it with the robot, or I do ICG injection that I can see it under Firefly with the robot that I can dissect the, the adhesions. Then I do agree with Mona. The knowledge of anatomy is everything, you know. So you, I usually try to dissect from a, from a, from the midline to the to the lateral, and I usually start with them safe spaces because I do pararectal spaces and paraphesical spaces because those are the safe spaces and avascular. Then I can approach it to the side, and I use traction contraction technique. That's why I like to feel things. I, I, I use EEA sizer, for example, in a rectum that I can feel the rectum. And then I do meticulous dilation, di dissection. <clears throat> and I disagree with, uh, with a lot of things that if removing the adhesion is going to come back. I think the first lesson and the first thing I learned, and, and that always helped me, restoring anatomy is everything. Because when you restore the anatomy, it, it would help you in two ways. Number one, then you know what you're doing. And if you can, you can excise any endometriosis lesion and adhesion, and number two, if you get to the complication, you can fix the complication. Uh, you can you you know where the ureter is. You know where the uh, iliacs are. You know you know what you, where your rectum is. You know where the sigmoid colon is, and you know where your appendix is. So I do think the restoring anatomy is everything. And I do think that for the past couple of years, I've been doing it on my own, and previously with, when I was a fellow, uh, I think also when I was in endometriosis uh, in the CEC. A couple of times we went back, you know, uh, we had to operate on somebody that I operated before for other reasons, you know, they come back. And we had a pretty good results of restoring anatomy, excising endometriosis lesions. And then we also use PRP. And now recently I use T-cell or Vistacil to actually surface the area after the surgery to actually speed up the, the healing process for preventing future adhesion. And I do agree with John and also Mona. I do think the, fir the, the first three to five days are very critical because that's where adhesions happen. So that's how I approach, approach it. And I usually do a combination of a laparoscopy and a robot, both together. When I do think that I'm done with the haptal feedback, I do think that you have kind of like a vision feedback with, with robot when you, you know, pulling on the tissue and excising that. But, but the camera of the robot, the way actually you're looking at the posterior walls, I think is amazing. I mean, I, I actually think... 
I mean, my opinion is that you can feel with it with the robot. And I actually, in terms of count tension, tension, counter tension, I actually use CO2 more for my dissection rather than actually stretching tissue or causing, because I feel like that can cause trauma. So I'll make the incision with a laser. I'll let the CO2, which is the insufflation, right. go in. And that, then I just tease the, the planes apart. I don't really put tension, counter tension. I, I do this. Either. Actually, I do. I do the Mentally, same. I do. I yeah. I do the same thing. However, I, I of of course these are the these are the minimal invasive techniques, and I do the same thing. However, I like to skeletonize. Like I like to feel behind the dense adhesion and skeletonize it, and go slowly by slowly and open it. Either way, I think. I agree. I think you can get some sort of feedback with the robot as well. You know, I mean, the the the, the more you do it, I think that then you get a visual feedback, and I, we all get it. Yeah, you know? it's a visual feedback. But, but but yeah, but I I I still like to feel the things, and I like to use my hands to open things. So I'm kind of like a little bit of old school minimal invasive surgery. Yeah. And I want to ask you, dude. When, when I grew do... up in medicine, yeah. laparoscopy was in its infancy, and yeah. they said you don't have a tactile sense with laparoscopy. So, <laughs> no, okay. <laughs> That's funny. Um, Can you yes, talk a little I, bit about, patients don't know what PRP is. Do you want to explain a little bit about that? Yeah, sure. It's a plasma-rich plasma. So you basically get the, the patient serum and they participate in, in, in a specific uh, device. And they get their own, basically, uh, their own serum helping them to heal. They have a, they have a, it has a growth factor. It has a platelet-rich uh, serum that helping the surface the area, healing the area faster. So there's many things that you can use. People using stem cells. Yeah, uh, using the amniotic fluid, but those are more expensive. There's T cell, there's Vista cell, the different things that you can actually put it in the dissected area to helping with the preventive uh, prevention of adhesion in the future. But I do think the whole, the, the main take home message is restoring anatomy because when you're restoring anatomy, you actually, if you go back next time, you actually know where you're going. I think that's the first lesson for me. So um, it's actually a very, so we, go ahead, Dr. Delamba, you go. You're waving. Go, he, good night, Dr. Delamba. He's yeah. he's on dog walking duty. So I, I think um, some people have stopped. So with the endometriosis crowd, you often have people that have, I hate the word comorbidities, but, but other conditions. And so People with the autoimmune conditions don't often do well with the PRP because it's their own, um, awesome. it's already their own blood. You're using something else, Dr. Arati. What are you using? So I'm using as a adept, which is a 4% isodextrin. It's a basically, a I, I don't, I hate to say it, but it's kind of like a sugar syrup. It's a very like slippery substance that kind of coats everything inside so, um, and it's also an anti-inflammatory. So it coats everything with this slippery substance that's also anti-inflammatory. So it prevents um, things from sticking together, number one. And number two, it's uh, it's kind of like soothing or healing or, you know, so it, it helps with um, reducing the inflammation and adhesions. I do, um, Dr. Uh, Fat Hatcher, you, you talked about Tisil. So Tisil, if you if you look at it, it's it's a fibrin matrix. So mm -hmm. it's actually, uh, it's good for hemostasis, but I wouldn't mm -hmm. use it as an adhesion prevention agent. I do sometimes use it if I feel like there's too much like ooziness or bruising where there's just a lot of raw surface, but mm -hmm. um, sometimes I'll use it in combination with ADAPT. But with fibrin, you have to be a, a little bit careful because fibrin in itself can cause um, inflammation. So it's, yeah. It's, I, I, yeah. You know, you know, Mona, I think you, you brought up a good point. The thing is, we really don't know what causing is iatrogenic adhesion. Like the a lot of people talking about it bleeding, you know, maybe causing the maybe by bleeding you can cause adhesion. Maybe post up inflammation can cause adhesions. Those well, are we all know the inflammation factors. causes adhesions, right? Because anything right, that right, causes right. inflammation causes adhesions. But if, and I think but that if, bleeding causes inflammation, which causes adhesions, just like infection, right? <laughs> Anybody that develops a post-op pelvic abscess or an infection in the pelvis or PID is going to develop adhesions. That it, it's, so it, I've been, 
let me tell you what I've done. There is a, there is no randomized double blind clinical trial about which one is better than the other one. However, I do think when after my my endo surgeries, I wash the areas, like irrigate the area copiously, and then put T seal, Vista seal, or anything like that. If I if I do have a PRP, PRP is my, is my to go, but I sometimes don't have a PRP. Uh, and and then you know I kind of like come down with the CO two pressure to see if there's any bleeding or anything like that, and then uh, I finish the surgery. But anything can help. I mean, I do think this is another thing, and I agree with you. This is kind of like anticoagulation. Uh, Doctor Sean, and, you have a comment. Uh, well, yes, adhesions have been on the face of the earth for years. Adhesion form from inflammatory changes. It doesn't matter whether that is iatrogenic or infection or anything you do to the pelvis. And they are all the same when they form. You can't tell. Endometriosis, whatever. Adhesion formation, number one. There, are, there were studies in 1990 talk about adhesion reformations. So whenever you lie to the adhesions at the same site, you can bet that it's going to reform at about 60-80%. And you can quote Dr. Diamond's study back in the 90s. And adhesion prevention, the best thing is to not to use anything that we think that we can prevent adhesions. It's all the surgical technique, but again, goes back to the genetics. So the adhesion form, any inflammatory changes, infection, you form adhesions. That's when the fibrinolysis is supposed to take away the adhesion. When that fail, adhesion form. So is the person's underlying genetic, how well is the fibrinolysis to take away the adhesions? So this is a summarize of what I have heard. Does adhesion cause pain? Yes and no. But Does Dr. Chang, if you look at the studies with ADAPT, the adhesion for second look studies, adhesion reformation was less than nine to 10% with okay. ADAPT. So oh, no. it does it does reduce the, oh, the uh, depth. It's the same thing at depth, separate film. Yeah, all, have similar. Yeah. All those are not going to work. And at depth in information and data was not that strong. So if I'm gonna use a depth, I might as well just use the old fashioned, put the lactase ringer and a couple of liters in the belly, just flush it around. At depth it's gonna dissolve. So what you were saying that, you know, I thought that was a good thing about adhesion prevention. It wasn't. So there was not any single thing on the face of the earth, right at this minute, can prevent a good adhesion. The study is just not there, okay? I, I agree, I, I agree with and, Dr. Chang. And, there's no, and, there's no, there's nothing, I agree. All these company that adapt in into in the uh, seed or if anything about into seed, even though the strongest data on into seed is for fertility to become IVF to get pregnant, it's not really talk about adhesion. So, so if we look at all the numbers, it's not there. The best is the skill and the technique. But can we really make it now? I would like to see somebody who have done surgery within a week to go back there and to see how much adhesion. Everybody gonna get adhesions regardless. Feel me a semi or fix. The fixed adhesion doesn't cause pain. The feel me adhesions on the peritoneum and the ovary to the peritoneum cause more pain than the fixed adhesion. That's back in the 90s. The conscious sedation laparoscopy has already been done to prove that. So back in those days, they know that. So again, do we know a lot of adhesions? I wish there is something that we could do that to figure that out, but we don't. Adhesion on the same site, if you take them apart, you're going to see that 60 to 80% on the same site is going to form. And well, Dr. Chai, I, I completely I completely agree with you. I do think there is nothing better better than the uh, no product is better than the other product. There's nothing there. It's just it's just a better technique. We're just trying. I I, I agree with you. I do think as a minimally invasive surgeons, I think uh, 
uh, one of the things we should do is it, it's all technique. We do our best to prevent adhesion as as the best. And I I completely agree with you. I think I think you you I completely agree that about the genetic factor, uh, trauma, and obviously lifestyle. And, and 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 I completely agree that the you know uh, you, there's nothing that is better than the other one. There's no product we can't we can't have we can't we can't say this we, is better than the other say, one. We can't say there's no product though. We can we we right. can't. There are products out there. They may have similar outcomes, and that using them may help. We can't say that it's not helping or that it's the same as saline because Dr. Chang, the study did do a randomized control study with saline as the control. And saline did have worse adhesions well, than uh, number one. Uh, number all, right, two, all right, we gotta, we gotta move forward. Well, um, 2023, we talk about this in the 2010. Was yeah, but I think, I, I have yeah. to say, I, products have come Yes, a long way. As have <laughs> surgical education. You know, they were ne the surgery they did in the '90s is not the surgery they do today. Right, well, right. I completely, I completely agree with you. I think I do think the surgery, the surgery we do here right now, is way better than '90s because I do think that we we are actually more trained. We already know a lot of, you know, tech better techniques now. Plus, we use the better product. I do think here it is. I I do think that I can go in the middle. I do think I agree with with both of you. I, I agree with Mona and I, I do agree with Dr. Chun. I do think there's nothing better than the other one, but we can use our own hypothesis, our own hypothesis, our, our own judgment and thinking, maybe if I put this to prevent more bleeding or prevent more adhesions or maybe using a growth factor to helping reperitonize the area faster, maybe it's going to help because I do think it's going to be very, very difficult study to have... You know, I mean, I agree. Maybe it's ten cases should be okay to go back in seven within the seven days to see what, how did you do that, and how would you do that? I don't think it's possible in the private practice. I do think maybe that goes to maybe academic center that they yeah. maybe can sign up somebody for it that. Takes many numbers, and we know that carbon dioxide itself is a adhesion formation issues, and the dry carbon dioxide that infused to the abdomen can cause adhesion formation. So there are so many other factors in that. Like if you look- there are other factors. I'm just saying that we should do everything in our power to try to reduce adhesion. Well, as much as we and... would want to do, when it forms, it's gonna <laughs> form. So unless there's a study with so many, the end probably need to be close to a thousand to be able to have all the confined everything else to be able to sort that out. All right. But we're gonna have yeah, to nothing. shelve this discussion till the endometriosis summit. At, okay. the, end of, at the endometriosis have summit, we have a session on adhesion management with Dr. Arati and Dr. Young, um, who both are using two very different techniques. One is straight stick. One is robotics, and one is using Gore-Tex, and one is using a different material. Oh, I, I know that part. So that's a good discussion with... Uh, right. I, also, I know Patrick I, does use Gore-Tex. I know Patrick does use Gore-Tex. I know yeah. that. While we're here, I, I just, I want to, because we do a lot of patient education, all, and all three of you are going to have a different approach, as do I. Patient has the surgery, a clean surgery... Um, and they come back with more pain and they are hell bent on more surgery because it must be adhesion. What is, you're each going to get a chance to answer. What is your process for evaluating that? Because I, as a pelvic PT, am not somebody who assumes it's the adhesion causing the pain. Dr. Orati, what is your approach to that? Well, I mean, the very, very first approach is a very good history and physical examination, right? Extre listening to when the pain started, how it started, what the type of pain, where it comes, when it when it comes, what relieves it, what positions, all of that. Like, it's it's it, I can't assume that pain is pain. Pain is there's many different types of pain. There's many different onsets of pain. I, I will evaluate their bladder function, their bowel function, their pelvic floor, their sexual function. Um, they're, you know, if they're menstruating, what their periods are like, where the pain is, when it comes, when it goes 
to really get honed down on, on what is the pain. Does it sound like pain from inflammation, from endometriosis? Does it sound like pelvic floor muscle tension or muscular type pain? Does it sound like a neuro neurogenic pain, like a, a nerve hyperesthesia? Does it sound like a, a bladder source, like painful bladder syndrome, which Dr. Chung is always talking about? Does it sound like uh, something that might be related to bowel inflammation? I have a lot of patients that have like SIBO and other bowel issues that have bowel pain. So it's a very difficult thing to like give you the general approach, but it, depending on their history and physical exam, then I would try to determine or hold down what the causes of their pain are and see, do they need nerve blocks? Do they need bladder installations? Do they need pelvic floor PT? Do they need gabapentin? Do they need, you know, other, other treatments to try to figure out if we can get rid of that pain? I don't necessarily jump back into surgery unless I really do think it is recurrent endometriosis or if I see some evidence of endometriosis either on my pelvic exam, ultrasound, MRI or whatever um, in that evaluation process. And I also do like tumor markers to see if CA125 or 199 are elevated, indicating inflammation of the peritoneum. And then I'll treat accordingly. But Having surgery after surgery after surgery isn't necessarily the best thing. Having said that, I do have a patient that every couple of years she'll come to me and she's like, Dr. Arati, my, my endometriosis is back. I know it. I can feel it. And I kid you not, like I literally have done four complete cleanouts of endometriosis, like stripping all the peritoneum, removing all the endometriosis on her. By the way, no adhesions every time when I go in. So let me just tell you. And the endometriosis is back. Like it, it the, you can see the lesions. They they're active and they're back where she exactly where she thinks they are. So it is interesting that some patients are in tune with their body, and sometimes you do have to reoperate on patients where endometriosis has come back, even though you've done a complete excision before and you literally have the pictures and the videos to prove it. But some people it just comes back and you and you have to reoperate. But it's not the first thing I will do. Um, I have to try other things first and try to evaluate the other possible sources of pain and treat those as well because you're treating the whole person. You can't just assume that pain is endometriosis. The endometriosis causes so many other side causes of pain, whether that be you know pelvic floor muscle tension, whether it be nerve hyperesthesia, whether it be painful bladder syndrome, GI issues, et cetera, et cetera, that you have to treat first and make sure that you're minimizing that those kind of things and then try to treat the patient as a whole. Excellent. Dr. Fathatcher, anything to add? Well, yes. Thank you very much, Mona. I do think very systematic as somebody who is minimally invasive surgeon and also urogynecologist and pelvic floor surgeon. Uh, I kind of like categorize it to three levels. First of all, I do think even though we're talking about endometriosis is 10% of women population, even though they said reproductive age. I have seen so many postmenopausal with endometriosis. I do think it's more common than that, 10%. So anybody with the public pain coming in, I do think it should be endometriosis to me until prove otherwise if I see them. So number one, I do think history and physical is very important, but I categorize it to three, three categories. Reproductive organs causing pain, or maybe GI, reproductive, and a bladder. I agree with you that I go to that I, I look at the pelvic as a three-level story. So the first level is, is a GU tract, which means bladder, kidney, and ureter. And then the second level is a reproductive system, including a uterus, uh, vulva, vagina, any, any problem with any of those areas, cervix uh, in, uh, and ovaries, any problem with any of those areas, including fibroid, including cyst, including vulvodynia, including STDs, any of those can cause pelvic floor uh, can, can cause pelvic pain. And then also nerve problem, which is then a pudendal neuralgia. You have to think about a sciatica. You have to think about any other things. When it comes to the organs, uh, when it comes to the muscle area, I always evaluate different muscle. Obviously, you're a pelvic floor uh, PT. So we're always looking at different muscle to see which one, levator and eye muscle, is it the, uh, uh, which one, bulbar cavernosis is painful. Specific muscle pain tenderness is very important. Uh, I do think it's important to check for uh, <clears throat> operators internists, you know, uh, area that you can feel for the pin pinpoint the pain in the muscle area is very important. So I kind of like categorize it depends on where I kind of like 
how the patient is giving me the history of pain. Is this the pain because of the ovulation? Is this the pain related to menstrual cycle? Is this the pain related to intercourse? Is this the pain related to the bladder if the bladder gets full? So those are the area that I kind of evaluate. And, and as, as you mentioned, I, I kind of like target that area. But I always, at the end, saying, if I'm going for, for example, for Botox injection to pelvic floor, I always say, you're going to be under anesthesia. Why don't I like, put the camera inside and take a look to see if there's any endometriosis? And they, most of my patients, they agree. And they, they like to be evaluated. And, and, and they want to know if this is not endometriosis causing this problem. So that's how I evaluate the patients. But before, again, before I come up to the conclusion, I do my homework. I do cystoscopy. I get the MRI. I do ultrasound. I do examination. I do. I, I disagree with the with again with the, with the, with this area of the ACOG practice bulletin that they said the endometriosis symptom does not and a staging does not go with your examination. I do think if you examine patient correctly, yes. you can actually pinpoint what you're actually feeling and the patient's feedback about the sharp pain, they can tell you exactly what, if this is endometriosis or not. Um, and I, I think most of this uh, pelvic floor muscle spasm that causing to the vulvodynia and vestibulodynia caused by some sort of irritation of the peritoneum inside that actually injured the uh, uh, insulting a muscle going to, through the spasm. So I do think besides um, you know, pinpointing it, there is some sort of a trauma. As somebody who treats vulvodynia like for a living, I don't, yes, there can be something stimulating the muscles, but the reality is it's very well proven that it's the feedback to, through the spinal cord to the brain that's caught and then back down that's causing the spasm and the spasm begins as a protective measure. It does, right. you know, it's trying to protect the body. It's not necessarily a bad thing, but then it becomes that's chronic. Yeah, most of this, most of vulvodynia is another thing. Vulvodynia is the extreme version of defense mechanism, right? So you don't want to go, anything goes inside, then you have a spasm, severe spasm. But I'm talking about people that they also have anal spasm, you know, that goes the whole area. But if if they have vulvodynia, which I had the extreme case not too long ago. She she came to me because of vulvodynia. She never she was thirty four years old, never had an intercourse, and she was crying. She says, "Oh, my fiance is gonna leave me because I we never we can't even have an intercourse, and then I have severe severe dysmenorrhea that I can't even put the tampons in." So I put her on sleep. I did the, the I scoped her. She had stage two endometriosis not too long. I, I injected the Botox to her pelvic floor and she's using dilators now. But she also had endometriosis. So it started from like early childhood with the with the pain that goes extreme, that you have severe pain that you really I think it blocks you psychologically somewhere too. I think it's trauma, it's the trauma goes to your you know, you know, it's so effective that goes to that defense mechanism that you really hold yourself up. And then the word, the, the extreme is going to be the severe vulvodynia. But if you purely have oh. vulvodynia, I agree. We're going to have, um, who's really an expert on vulvar disorders, we're going to have Amy Stein on in just a few weeks. I'll also send viewers back to, there's a webinar with Abhishek Mangeshikar and Dr. Gabby Mawad, where they talk about endometriosis in the vicinity of the hypogastric nerve right. and plexus, also stimulating um, vulvar issues. Dr. Chung, before we close out, anything to add to the reevaluation discussion? That's a very broad subject. I know. I Amy mean, is from reproductive to postmenopausal and so they are different is endometriosis they have something to do with it maybe when they were younger endometriosis is part of it but when they are postmenopause then they still have the symptom valvodynia vestibulitis that you have to rule out primary is pudendal neuralgia until proven otherwise so you got to make sure that it's not the pedonal nerve problem before you can think that it's his primary vulvodynia elvis velitis. And um, as you know, endo, uh, pelvic organs, it's like a Christmas tree, my gosh. The pelvis, the 
female reproductive organs only created pain for about 20%. The GI is about 30. Myofascial, the pain in the muscle is about 20. And then you have the genital urinary is about 30. So basically, they all share, but they don't always become a single entity that causes the pain. That usually is multifactorial. It's like the connection. They all involve in it. If the GI is involved, if the blood is involved, the muscle is involved, do they have endometriosis? Not, I'm not quite sure. Maybe endometriosis is the fire fanner. They just fan the fire. So as of yet, we can talk about all of this, but how are you going to approach it? Where do you start? And bladder is part of the biggest, it's the biggest organs in the pelvis. It's more than a liter sometimes that involve in the bulk of it. But the nerves involved in the bulk of it, the inferior hypogastric nerves also involve in it. So for pain is different. Endometriosis is different. If endometriosis causes it, you excise it, the pain is supposed to be gone. But then if the pain comes back, I think you, all of those are here, are expert surgeons that either you miss a spot or two that you may have seen it on the recurrent, but how fast are they going to grow? Within a year or two years, three years, they're going to grow so much that causing the same pain. So I believe that in myself, when you have an expert surgeon remove the endometriosis, when the pain comes back, it doesn't mean that it's endometriosis. It could be a pelvic neuralgia. It's just the nerve, the muscle, whatever that is causing the problem. So especially like Mona, your expert surgeon, you expert surgeon, you remove it, it's gone. I mean, are we missing one spot or two? Maybe when it's come back, it's just one spot or two. How fast endometriosis grow? Is it going to be a big nodule or just a couple of implants? So we got to think about that. When the pain comes back, it doesn't mean that it is the endometriosis comes back. It could be, I don't know, it's a neuralgia. It's just the nerve is starting to come back and causing the problem. So that's my take. So, you know, hey, Sally, I just have the paper finally submitted. Oh, wonderful. All yeah. right. We okay. are 10 minutes over. I'm very excited about that, though. I've been waiting a lot of years. Okay. Um, so you- if this insanity appeals to you, um, <laughs> we actually have a lot of doctors commenting all over Facebook and LinkedIn. If these conversations where people get to talk openly about different opinions about the same thing, which is really very common in medicine, Um, appeals to you. Please join us at the Endometriosis Summit March 8th through the 10th, available virtually and in person in Celebration, Florida. I will see you all soon. Good night. Good night. Good night. Is that right?